which means that the next day after you've done your fast, you are just energized. You're ready to kill it and you can do an unbelievable workout. So what, what started you down this path towards the keto diet and intermittent fasting? What, what piqued your interest? Well, let me give you an example of how I changed my views. When uh, many years ago, I thought it was foolish, and that's being kind for people who were fasting. I thought clearly the evidence is obvious that you need to eat all the time. And in fact, 90% of the population, according to Sachin Panda, eats more than 12 hours a day. More than 12 hours a day. I know that's not you. I know you have a one to two hour window frequently. But uh, so, you know, that most all of us are doing the same thing, believing the same. And I changed that and I recognized that, especially as keto started coming on board and experimenting with it. And Mark Sisson taught me about metabolic flexibility. I tried it for myself and was just amazed at what it did. Then I startedly started to finally appreciate some of the subtle molecular bio biological components, which we'll talk about further today, like autophagy and stem cell activation. So, and this cycling, which is so important. And, and you know, and there's, there's a, and I, I'll, I'll share more of how I changed my views as we go on, but it's, you've got to learn and adapt and, and really uh, modify things as you acquire new information. So, you know, your, your latest book, Keto Fast, um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of books out there on the keto diet. Uh, that's yes. the new buzz thing. So, you know, and I've read your book and I thought, you know, it's fabulous. Folks listening and, and watching uh, gave you a nice blurb that's on your back cover. Uh, so uh, you're, you're preaching to the choir, but I want you to mm -hmm. preach to our listeners and our viewers. Sure. What, what new approaches are you taking in the book, which I think are just great? Yeah, well, uh, thank you. It's uh, some, the, the, the basic strategy is to become, first become metabolically flexible, which I discussed in my previous book, Fat for Fuel. That is the primary issue where, and you do that with a simple step that doesn't cost anything, saves you money, and radically improves your health. What is that? Compress your eating window. When I give a lecture, I feel I succeeded if I can get that one single message to the audience, compress your eating window. And you're a big fan of that and you have been you actually much, much before I, I understood that fact. So six, I, you know, so what's a compressed eating window? You know, 12 hours, which 90% of people aren't doing is not enough. I think I, 14 hours probably starts to get the benefit. And I think a sweet spot is 16 to 18. I think most of us don't have to go to your level. And, uh, you know, I think probably remember 16, I only do that six months out of the year. So, yeah, what, what was that two hours? And what's the what's the then, then you go to four hours? Yeah. Well, so in, the rest of the year, I, I go to about 16 hours. Yeah. OK, 16 hours. That's fine. Then that's not a big deal. I'm glad because, you know, to, to do that long term, I think you're going to run into some complications because really one of the basic tenets of the book is to is to go into these cycles which you're we designed to because the human species was never designed to have access to food 24 7 just that that wasn't the case so we have to replicate that pattern if we want to maximize our biological benefits and what our what our genetics are designed for yeah no you're absolutely right as you know uh, my new book the longevity paradox also stresses exactly what you're saying we should be eating in circadian rhythms. And uh, yes. there, there is just utmost evidence, even in looking at modern hunter-gatherers, that there is cyclically feeding periods and there are extended periods of time where we do not eat or we eat very minimally. And so you, it's this cycle that you so eloquently talk about in Keto Fast is, is really important. So give me an example. What, is, what does that mean for the average person? How, how do you in Keto Fast structure this? Well, after I wrote Fat for Fuel, I was very excited and was pretty firmly convinced, this is an example of me changing my views, that the strongest, the most powerful metabolic intervention I've ever seen in nearly four decades of clinical practice was multiple day water fasting. I mean, it's profound benefits. We could talk a bit about that if you haven't discussed that previously. But uh, so I decided to write a book, which was Keto Fast. 
And as I started to research a book and discuss it, discuss and network with some of the experts in the field, I realized that that was an incorrect observation. It is a powerful uh, intervention. There's no question. It's been done for thousands of years. It's an integral part of virtually every major religion on the planet. And it wouldn't persist for so long if there wasn't some value to it. Clearly, there's value. But what I learned is that it was useful historically. But we've evolved into the 21st century and not, not as a species, but more our technology. And as a result of the technology, we've accumulated not thousands, but tens of thousands of these chemicals, industrial chemicals that we're all exposed to. It's virtually impossible not to be. I mean, it is virtually everyone watching this is. I mean, you'd have to be in a remote, rural, isolated part of the planet when it, but, and that's, you know, no one watching this. So anyway, the, most of these chemicals are fat soluble and they get stored. They, do, they typically aren't immediately metabolized. They're stored for safety in your fat cells. Right. And when you do multi, multi-day water fasting, you're using your fat for energy. And then these fat, these fat soluble toxins are released go into your bloodstream, and they cause side effects for a number of reasons. One, because they're toxic, but primarily because the people don't have ramped up enough detoxification to address that. So uh, I thought that was a massive flaw, and I developed strategies to accommodate for this and essentially develop the 21st century fasting, which has multiple other benefits, side effects and benefits I can discuss. Yeah, I think that's so important. Uh, actually, when I wrote my first book years ago, I was very impressed with uh, Dr. Ray Wolford's uh, observations in Biosphere yep. 2, where sure. those folks, uh, he was a pathologist at UCLA, as you know, and he actually looked at the Biospherians' uh, heavy metals in their blood when they lost literally 35% of their body weight in the first six months, because they were literally starving to death. Uh, yes. And, and he was really excited about it, actually. But when he looked, <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was a wonderful thing. But when he looked at their heavy metals and their toxins, they, they went massively high. And it actually took them a year to return down to normal. And I, I write about that in The Longevity Paradox as well. And I think your observation and Dr. Wolford's and certainly mine that we've got to be very careful with everybody going on these uh, six, seven day water fasts uh, because we do not have a system to handle these heavy metals. And again, Dr. Wolford proved this, you know, 20 years ago. And yeah. so I think if, if we take nothing away from, uh, else from keto fast, I think your observation that, you know, wow, I was really into water fasting and now wait a minute, let's put the brakes on here because we now have some data that we ought to be cautious about this. Here's the other benefit of doing this keto fasting, which is a partial fast. And I'll ex ex explain in great detail what that consists of. Okay. But essentially you can do it because it's so easy to do, you can do it twice a week, which means you can do it a hundred more than a hundred times a year and get all the magnificent benefits I described earlier and I'm sure that you describe in your book, a hundred times a year rather than doing it, you know, you know, in five, 10, 15 times a year. So collectively you're just radically improving the metabolic benefits by this type of intervention and strategy. And in addition, when you do only a partial fast, which is essentially a two day fast, it's a little bit less than a two day fast instead of a five day fast or a fasting mimicking diet, which in Walter Longo's case is thousand calories the first day and 750 the last, the next four is still not enough. And you're still a pretty, beat up by the fifth day and it's really hard to get get into the the, the the scoop of things because another benefit that i did not mention earlier of fasting and i'm sh i don't see it on your hand i was looking but i don't see your aura ring did you take you're not wearing it now or oh it's there okay i i'm, I'm using i have to use a backup computer and my monitor resolution is pretty poor so it was hard to see your, your finger but the yeah so there you go so you would know this and you've done the fasting and i'm sure you can confirm that on the day you are fasting, your recovery rate of recovery index, as Aura turns it, goes through the roof. Yeah. Typically it goes up 10 or 20 points, which means that the next day after you've done your fast, you are just energized, you're ready to kill it, and you can do 
unbelievable workout and really um, challenge your body and activate these, the switches to turn on muscle growth, something that we call anabolism, which you don't want to do when you're fasting. And the cool thing is, is that when you are fasting, your growth hormone goes up by 300%. Now, you might say, well, hey, growth hormone increases IGF-1. Doesn't that suppress autophagy? And normally it does, but when you're fasting, the, the receptors in the liver become relatively resistant, so your growth hormone can be high and your IGF-1 is still low. So what does that mean when you have high growth hormone? It means when you work out and you have high growth hormone, my gosh, it's like taking steroid shots. So you get this all this benefit. So you, it gives you the opportunity to really uh, add an exercise program on top of the autophagy because you want to exercise when you're fasting. And then right after you're fasting, you feast. You have loads of branched chain amino acids, loads of healthy carbohydrates. And you're just, you're just, you're at the, you're just having a party. <laughs> it's great. So in other words, this is not all about deprivation. A lot of times. Oh, when... heck no. Heck no. And the beautiful thing about it, because, and you know this, once you're fasting, the other side benefit, in addition to the mental clarity, is that the hunger disappears. Right. So if someone like you, it's like you're not even doing it because you, you normally, if you're eating one meal, that's it. You just lower the calorie rate. Right. So, and then, then basically you eat your next meal and you're off to the races. So it's, it's, you don't even think about it once you, once you have that restricted t window of six to eight hours, uh, it becomes as easy as can be. You know, it's interesting. Uh, my, my research in, 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 in Yale was on evolutionary human biology. And one of the interesting things is, and this has been confirmed and you know, that actually when you are fasting, when you're literally starving, your performance actually increases. And the reason, evolutionary-wise, if, if we were starving, we had to catch that animal. And if we didn't catch that animal, that, you know, that was curtains. Uh, yeah, that was it. And so it's fascinating that you know, we have a built-in evolutionary advantage to perform well while fasting. It makes incredible sense. Uh, just to bring it down to what people can understand. And then, of course, when we caught that animal or we found the fruit tree or the honey tree, you know, we didn't sit there, oh, I'm only going to eat a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned in the introduction that many of the foods that we eat are less nutritious than they used to be. Uh, can you explain what's going on with that? Um, Again, nutrition has been um, mainly a business rather than uh, rather than a medicine, right? We we are pushing for food as medicine. Unfortunately, for the last decades, it was mostly uh, food was a business, and in business, you try to give, you try to increase your margin, so you want to give a little bit the cheaper food, and cheaper food means starches, meaning means glucose, means uh, you know less nutritious food versus the more nutritious food of, and and also means collect the fruits and the vegetables when they're still green, store them in the refrigerator, they mature just in, in without, without being on, on the mother tree, and then spray them with pesticides and herbicides and a little bit play with the, uh, mix the, mix the grains so that you get a higher gluten and a faster yield. And this is what business has meant versus what we should eat, which is definitely a, a lower gluten and more a fruit and a vegetable that, is, that are grown without pesticides and that are grown on the tree and the grass up until they mature. And this is why we lost the smell and the taste of fruits actually in the US. Um, and, and what we should do is consume more colorful, uh, we say eat the rainbow fruits and, and vegetables and go for more of the nutrients, uh, the vitamins, the minerals, and less for the sugar, less for the artificial changes we've imposed on food. And, and definitely even uh, there's a bigger story on fat as well, right? We, instead of Having the, the, the several several times fried oil and and um, and uh, and some kinds of trans fat is really to focus on um, olive oil and, and 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 fish oil and and everything that has high omegas and uh, even the nuts um, you know um, again going back business versus nut the the healthy oil sources are expensive so you don't see a lot of food based on macadamia and cashews you see them based on you know, peanuts and 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 fried French fries, uh, uh, source of oil, etc. So that's that's unfortunately a big uh, change that happened to us. We as humans, 
most of our life we grew, you know, we needed water. It was the most vital thing that we needed. So we grew around rivers. Um, and, um, and this is where not just needed water to drink it, but also this is where there's green grass, there were fruits, there were trees, and there was food. And we were eating a plant-based diet mainly. And because fish doesn't, doesn't fly, doesn't run fast, doesn't see us, it was easy to fish. So we were mainly vegan with eating fish from time to time, what we call a pescatarian diet. With time, we evolved to hunt a little bit more, so adding a little bit of meat to it. But uh, this is what I would qualify more as Mediterranean diet. And this is what we should go back to uh, rather than the fast deliveries at home today that's given us a lot more of the the carbs and, and unhe- unhealthy fats versus, uh, fats versus uh, um, the, the nutrient-dense uh, fruits and vegetables. So, uh, you know, I got to, to know you guys um because of, of your research in you know uh, the fasting mimicking diet so there's a lot of different types of fasting and calorie restriction and every, everybody's confused yeah so yeah. C- take us through what's the difference between oh water fasting intermittent fasting time restricted eating and a fasting mimicking diet. Holy cow, I'm, yes. now, I'm even <laughs> confused now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we started publishing about fasting some four or five years ago, and the field picked up so big, and it's now actually the number one diet in the U.S., uh, two years in a row. Um, this year, clean eating kind of trumped it a little bit, but um, the diet that's being observed the most today in the U.S. is, is one, one of the kinds of fasting which we're going to explain uh, uh, today and and I'm going to start with you know on the first typology you have what we call intermittent fasting versus prolonged fasting. So this is the first thing people need to know. Intermittent fasting is fasting from a few hours up to two days, and then prolonged fasting is when you cross you go a little bit beyond two days. There used to be a tiny category called short-term fast, two to three days, but now we're trying to simplify it and just say zero to two days you're doing intermittent fasting two days and beyond, you're doing a prolonged fast. And the main separation is really, once you cross two days, the stress of fasting to the body is now, you know, superior, and therefore the body reacts differently. On the first two days, you can survive off burning your fat and using the liver as credit as a, for neoglucogenesis. When you cross that, the stress is so big that now there's cellular action. We're going to talk about that with prolonged fasting. But just for people to keep in mind is when you cross the second day, there's something called autophagy and the cells tries to rejuvenate to survive. And we're going to talk about that. Um, so let's start with intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, a few hours to two days. Most people fast within one day. They try to prolong a little bit the period, the overnight fast. So when we sleep, we're fasting, right? We're not eating. Uh, I hope so. Actually, a lot of us do eat uh, overnight. But when you're when you're sleeping, you're fasting. in uh, a lot of people are trying to stay for 12 hours without food or extend it to 16 hours. So within the same day, what you, t- what you call intermittent fasting is the same concept as the flip side of time-restricted eating. A lot of people hear that word. And uh, 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 Sachin Panda actually is one of the main researchers there. Is The more you extend the overnight fast, the more you're restricting the period of food intakes. We call it time-restricted eating. So if you're fasting for 16 hours, then your time restrict your time that you restrict your food is for eight hours, and vice versa. If you're um, if you're fasting, say for 12 hours, that means you're doing a time restricted eating of 12 hours. So within the same, when you talk within the same day, intermittent fasting and time restricted eating are just the, the, the flip side of the same coin. Now, why it's becoming very popular to do intermittent fasting is is part of what we we're talking about is us as human changing our lifestyle and behavior. Um, historically, you know, we used to, uh, eat, you know, so the family would sit, eat at 6, 7 PM, the sun would, would be down and we would sleep. There was no refrigeration. There's no TV. There's no Netflix at home. And then we wake up the second day and we eat again in the morning. And this is your 12 hour of fast, which turns out to be very critical for our healthy aging. Um, because if you eat more frequently, if you eat over 18 hours, say what's happening is. Most of the part of the day, your body is ingesting food, and when you eat carbs and protein, you have the growth factor increase, insulin, and insulin-like growth factor, so you're in more an anabolic state. You're always 
grow, biologically you're pushed to age faster and you're stocking the extra calories in fat. So you're in fat building. It's like putting money in your account all the time. Your bank account will grow. So it's same, same the fat, same, same as fat. What you want to do, you want to balance how much you put in the bank and then allow time to spend it before you put again, uh, you put the money again. And I think that's key is to do at least 12 hours of fast, what we call the circadian fasting, meaning following the day and night, uh, the, the day and night cycle, which, you know, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was on the biological clock of the organs. Even the organs we discovered, they actually need that rhythm. They need to work for a certain period and then rest for other periods. The same way we sleep to rest our brain, every organ was functioning, and we have that biological clock again, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2017. So we are big proponents of what we call the circadian uh, fasting or the 12 hours of fast. Now, a lot of physicians in practice, which may, most of them treat uh, diabetes or, uh, or obesity or you know, primary care, they're proponents of a little bit extending the overnight fast all the way to 16 hours, what we call the 16-8 intermittent fasting. And they do it because their patients need to lose weight fast and need to correct the metabolic you know, issue. And this is when it's worth going up to 16 hours without the food to just accelerate a little bit this weight loss and reverse the metabolic issue. And this is called 16-8, 16, 16 hours fasting, eight hours of time-restricted eating. And it's becoming very, very popular. There's a little bit of caution here that I would I would tell people about is that 16, 8, or some people go to 18 hours or 20 hours, went from the clinics all the way to the general public. Um, but most people, if they're not really overweight or they have a short-term you know, uh, uh, health condition that they, they're trying to fast for, they don't need to go all the way to 16 and 18 and 20 hours. And your body tells you that. You start feeling a headache. You start feeling weak. And actually, you do lose the weight when you ex when you extend the fast because your body needs calories and your brain, first and foremost, is 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 uh, is operating at peak in the morning. Your your cardiovascular, uh, you know, the heart needs to to pump your muscles. You're going to work. You're the most active in the morning, so this is why you lose the weight if you skip that breakfast. But at the same time, you're stressing your vital organs. So we're more of a proponent of do 12 hours only if you're healthy and fit. And then if you need to extend it a little bit for short-term reasons, probably that's a good thing to do on the short term. Now, there's been a number of publications, some of them recent, about the, the Ramadan fast. Um, so there's a 12-hour a window of not eating. You eat before yes. the sun comes up. You don't even drink during the day. And then you eat yeah. again when the sun goes down. And there's some actually dramatic uh, health changes, including, as you probably know, uh, turning off oncogenes uh, with that method. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about the Ramadan fast as a, as a health? Well, uh, we want to clarify the Ramadan fast is, follows the 12 hours, which what we're talking about, but is, is it concept coming from, meaning practice 12 with, with the old type of religion, the Orthodox type, the, 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 in the recent days, we're feasting in the, in the 12 remaining hours. So within the context of the true meaning of fasting for 12 hours, this is something exactly what we're talking about. And it, it does actually, um, there's, a, there's another big article, I recommend people read it in Gemma Oncology, um, and it talks about breast cancer, even not just prevention, but also women with the breast cancer. They, I think they were looking at the uh, nurse health study, and they they looked at women with breast cancer who fasted less than 13 hours versus more than 13 hours. There was even a difference in recurrence of the of the cancer, which which makes sense. You know, the less you eat, uh, the less you're pushing your body to grow, and when the body biologically ages, it gets more prone to diseases, and also you're less pushing your extra calories to go to into fat and therefore insulin resistance, which is one of the mothers of many diseases. We traditionally, people think carb is, is diabetes. It's not just carb, it's food in general, proteins and carb both push in both direction, cancer and diabetes. So definitely we are meant to eat, then absorb, then spend, then eat again. What happened to us today, and that's, that's, the, that's the fasting or the time restricted eating, what's happening to us today, most Americans eat within the 18 hours time frame. So we eat, 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 and rest a little bit. So we're always adding to the bank account. The bank account is increasing. Unfortunately, this is not fin financial. You want it to increase, but on a, on a health, in a health wise, uh, you don't want the fat to increase, your reserves to increase, and this is leading to diseases and multiple 
multiple directions, not just diabetes, but cancer, Alzheimer's, and cardiovascular disease. That, that, that was intermittent fasting, if you want. If, if uh, you know, the, the, we clarified that intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating are the same within one day. Intermittent fasting is up to two days. And it's the period of where your body says, you know what, I have enough fat, and, and if I need some credit, uh, I'll take it from the liver, but I'm, I'm okay. Two days, you know, I'll, I'll lose a little bit of weight. That's fine. And it becomes a little bit more stressful when you cross the second day. Again, it's not prescriptive for some people day and a half or people two and a half days, but just uh, for the sake of typology, we talk about second day. Now you're going where, hmm, I did spend my bank account, right? So say you're the CEO of the company and suddenly you don't have revenues. You can hold, you can help, you know, hold it for a month or two and you can tap into your bank account and apply for a credit. But then when the bank account is going down, you're going to have to come back to your company and restructure it. You're going to have to, to be more cost effective in the way you do things. And the body does the same thing after day two. It comes to the cells and say, hey, I cannot nourish you any longer from the outside. You have to look inside for sources of calories, organelles, debris, uh, you know, some, some damage that you can fix, what we call cellular rejuvenation, or in a more scientific way, we call it autophagy or self-eat. What autophagy means, self-eat. So the cell tries to live on its intracellular calories and optimize its um, its operation. It's a, we call it restructuring in a in a financial in the financial world or the corporate world, which is hey, let's try to do the best out of what we have. That's important because now you're talking biologically. So intermittent fasting works on weight and certain little bit metabolic improvement just because it's two days. Now when you cross two days, you're talking more weight loss. You're talking more metabolic changes in cholesterol, triglyceride, inflammation, et cetera, but you're adding now the cellular improvement as well. So once you touch prolonged fasting, you're impacting all these three big uh, uh, important healthy aging metrics. Your weight, which you would lose really fast, the, 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 the excess weight, you're impacting your metabolic uh, uh, markers, cholesterol, triglyceride, HbA1c, et cetera, and then you're impacting as well a cellular or a biological change within the cell and all of those contributing to healthy aging. And this is what made fasting, if you want, uh, a big a big theory, a big thing to observe in the last three, four years and a big topic talked about. I want to add one thing, which is it is a natural thing. It's important because every decade we have a craze about a diet. You know, one day it's the Atkins, the other day it's the keto, the third day is the paleo. And these are human-made diets, which they have certain value, but certain disadvantages, I think the best thing you can do for your life, and, 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 and you mentioned this in your book, is to rematch us with what we're supposed to eat, which is a plant-based mainly solution with some intermittent fasting and two to three times per year do the prolonged fast in order to improve the cells and, and rejuvenate the cells. And I think rematching our body with what we were meant to eat is the diet is not going to be a fad, but it's going to be here to stay, and part of it is fasting. All right, so people are listening to this, and they're going, oh, come on now. Um, there's no way I'm going to not eat anything for, for three days. Come on. Uh, i got to yeah. go to work. i got to get the kids to school. They're yes. driving me crazy. Uh, and you, you hear this, and you know this. So take me to, you know, how did you guys get this crazy idea of designing a plant-based diet that mimics fasting? Yes. So um, you're right. And, you know, we, um, we as a neutral, the company that I'm currently the CEO of, we're a spinoff from University of Southern California. And USC has a longevity institute, which is probably the, the, uh, the, the leading institute in the world looking into fasting. And like you said, initially, we're just doing water fasting. And when we proved the value of water fast in flea and, 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 and worms, and they went to mice, and then we went to human trial. And this is where we got the surprise. Obviously, like you're saying, most people in a clinical trial, in a human trial, they don't want to fast for three or four or five days, right? And and we like a little bit more than four to five days because you want to at least a couple of days of cellular rejuvenation. So people couldn't fast in to, from four to five days. And uh, the National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute were you know, very generous into supporting USC in developing the fasting mimicking diet, meaning they're saying we're seeing really great mice data 
we want you to do the human data and we understand it's not safe or compliant. You know, we talk a lot about the positives about fasting. There are negatives about fasting. You know, when you stay for four days without food, you're literally or, or water or minerals or vitamin. It's not a, it's not a joke. It's, it's spending four or five days without very important nutrients, whether it's macro or micronutrients for the body. So uh, there's some risk doing that. And people obviously will not comply. They'll feel hungry and they get headaches and fatigues. So they were, the, the NIH was kind enough to sponsor the research to develop what we call the fasting mimicking diet, meaning can we nourish this body with ingredients while keeping at the cellular level the stress at the cell? So can we keep the stress of fasting on the cell so that the cell rejuvenates? And can we not uh, increase the blood sugar and increase, therefore, insulin? Can we not increase proteins and increase the signal of insulin-like growth factors so that the body is not realizing it's eating. It is being nourished, but it doesn't realize it. The sensors are not triggered. So uh, to simplify it is, you know, if you're the CEO of a company and you need a million dollars to operate the company, if, if we give you 200,000, are you going to feel fully satisfied that you're going to just not restructure? No, you're going to still feel that stress. And it's a little bit more complicated. The, the, the fasting mimicking diet, actually, we were able to not mimic fasting by starvation, and this is what took 12 years of research and over $36 million in, in funding, we were able to make fasting by nourishment. And that was very important. So we started looking at the cell, how the cell digests protein, how the cell digests carbs, what are the pathways, and how much can we give up every ingredient. Now we're beyond 75 ingredients. It's a nutrient-rich diet. And we're beyond 75 ingredients that the body and the cells get, each one at the level that the cell does not feel it's satisfied enough. And this is how we created the fasting mimicking diet. It's a plant-based diet. Um, it has very healthy, good fats uh, coming mainly from macadamia and, and other nuts. Um, again, which historically nutrition company didn't want to sell. They're the most expensive. And then uh, it's made of uh, fiber-rich, you know, source of carbs and, and has plant-based proteins. And every sequence is studied to actually get into your body, nourishes the cell without convincing the cell that there is food. And uh, it was an amazing discovery. To me, it's probably the biggest discovery in nutrition uh, for the last, you know, uh, years and years. And now we're in 18 clinical trials trying to see what are the benefits of a fasting when we can diet on different, on different conditions. And we're excited to see some of the early results uh, starting to get out there. Are you able to give us uh, a taste of what those clinical trials are showing? So... Uh, we, uh, we actually have, out of the 18 trials, probably we have eight on cancer. We have uh, two, two trials on diabetes, a few on cardiovascular and autoimmune diseases. Um, we cannot today, without really uh, uh, getting the results, really you know, uh, mention or position the diet for any of those. But in, um, in mice, there was a lot of promising data on showing, for example, if you, and this is an important concept, I think, moving forward, part of, we're talking about changing healthcare is, you know, cancer patients, historically, we gave them chemotherapy or hormone therapy and more recently immune therapy and CAR-T, et cetera, but we've never looked at their diet in a serious way. And that's very important because cancer, cancer is a cell that lost its inhibition, keeps replicating without, without stopping. That's why it grows fast and then spreads around, you know, the body. So how come we never thought about slowing the growth of cancer, not just by chemo, but by food, right? If a, if a cell has to grow fast, it needs food. And without food, it's going to grow slower. And probably this is how we talked about the GEM oncology paper of overnight fasting. Probably what's happening when every night you're fasting and you're prolonging it a little bit is you're underfeeding your breast cancer and therefore it cannot, it cannot grow as fast as, as it would like to, to grow. What we've observed in mice with a fasting mimicking diet is because we're going on a solid, you know, three, four days of fasting. And in humans, we do four days, uh, and then we add one day of refeeding. But now you really, really starve this cancer over four days, and we do it right before chemotherapy. So chemotherapy comes on day five, on day four. Um, so you got a good three days of fast. Day four is fasting as well, and chemo comes on day four. The cancer is so much sensitized to the chemotherapy that in mice we showed tremendous um, data on uh, on significant data on uh, slowing down the growth of the tumor. And in humans, we're about to publish on the same topic as well. 
And the concept is, as I said, you want to starve the cancer um, and you want to then have the chemo coming on a very weakened cancer and hopefully kill more cells. So I think this is an important point. Um, you're not anti-chemotherapy. Um, you're saying here's an you know, additional way to maximize the effect of chemotherapy. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not against any medicine, actually. I just am against the concept that medicine, that pills are the only solution. And I'm against the concept of the best thing we as brilliant minds have provided is, hey, we'll wait for you to be sick, and then we'll give you something that's not going to solve your disease, like it's just going to keep you sick. And even there, it's, you're not going to live longer, you're going to live shorter. So now it's like, it's not the worst case because we're losing a little bit of under longevity. And um, with the concept of, okay, if you get sick, and most of us, if not all of us, will have a chronic disease. And um, how can we first not have you get sick, er, sick early in your life? You know, why, why we're, uh, we should get the first cancer at age 50 or the first diabetes diagnosis at age 50? Why not push those at 70 and 80? And then when you get sick, it should be, we should do something a little bit more than just, uh, just a pill. If you think about it, you know, today, most of us either don't take anything per day or say one or two pills. Food, you take it three or four times per day. So it could be the biggest pill or the biggest poison that you put in your body. We're made of food that we eat and we eat every day. So it's, it's the same. It's the one thing that we put in our body multiple times. How come we have never thought about it as being one of the most powerful intervention for our prevention, but also when we're sick? And this is where we come uh, we're called a Nutra Nutrition for Longevity, and we focus on how nutrition can impact our health span and healthy aging when we're healthy, and how can we tailor nutrition for different health conditions to have, to support the patient uh, with better management. We're not here to be against uh, uh, the pills, and actually, we're here to empower uh, the um, the existing ways of the standard way of doing medicine, which is very valid and has gone through a lot of evidence-based validation. Uh, um, we're here to empower it. We're here to tell the healthcare system it's about medicines, but it's about food. It's about it's about exercise. It's about stress. It's about sleep. It's about feeling happy and giving and receiving love. All these factors are going to impact uh, the outcome of uh, of a health condition and and healthy aging. So speaking of uh, healthy aging and even longevity, since longevity is kind of in your title of El Nutra. Um, as you and I know, calorie restriction has been the, the only way to extend good lifespan. And there's some debate in primates. So one of the primate studies showed it did. The other primate study showed it did, didn't. You and I, I think, both agree why those two studies are different. Uh, I think it was the selection of foods in those two studies. But um, calorie restriction legitimately it will never get adapted by the vast majority of human beings because like you say people want to be happy and I do have some CR patients and I would not describe them as generally happy people um, <laughs> is that that's being kind I guess um, yeah so but your program um, tell us tell us about prolong and tell us about the food company that you guys now have. How, how does that fit, fit in into having us have a great lifespan? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the research that I talked about on the fasting mimic diet before is in a clinical trial. Now you mentioned the, 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 the name of our first product, which is not positioned for disease, but it's positioned for healthy aging, as you mentioned. And the Prolon is the first uh, to market fasting mimicking diet. It's a five days box of food. You receive it, you can order it, you get it at home. Either, uh, you know, um, we have 11,500 clinics now registered to, to recommend Prolon to their, to their patients. And, uh, and if you're healthy, you can take it three to four times a year to, again, optimize your weight, maintain healthy level of uh, metabolic balance and, uh, and, and enhance cellular cleaning. Um, we, we have studied fasting and aging for the last 20 years, and the fasting we're making night is the culmination of what can we do today in, in society to help people, like you said, not be on an everyday change on their lifestyle, not impose a new lifestyle on them. And, and we, 
Nutrition tried that multiple times, and whether it's low calorie, whether it's the Atkins, people want to enjoy their food. And so how can we help them first enjoy healthy food? That's the first solution. Number two is intermittently, can we do some corrections to help them? And the fasting mimicking diet is like the story of every college. If you go to any college and you go into a class, you have 85 to 90% of the students, they don't study every day. They, uh, you know, they, they try to balance a little bit of study with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of uh, school fun. And there's a good 10% of the class that really is very studious and studies every day. And these are the fit people in society. Now, the 85, 90%, they cannot study every day. They want to enjoy life. But what happens is five days before the exam, they do stress themselves. They sit, they study, you know, 18 hours, 20 hours a day, and they go and they pass the exam. The fasting mimicking night is kind of that. It's a superior level of stress. It's not a calorie restriction level of, hey, I lose weight with time. It's a true stress because fasting is the biggest stress you can impose on a cell. Every cell in your body needs calories. And when every cell feels a fasting mode, there's a transformation with the cells. So it's a higher level of stress. This is what the success of fasting is. The soup, the secret soup is the stress. Chronic calorie restriction is a little bit of drowning your bank account. When you stop giving money is when your CFO will call you and say, hey, like zero money is coming. Let's do something about it. And fasting is that higher stress, which we, when we were in college, a lot of people, you know, did this five days before the exam and you know, got by with an A minus, some a few times an A, and most times a B plus. And and I think this is one of the most practical solutions for society today. Is we definitely recommend people eat healthier um, during the 25 days, but for five days a month, they can do the fasting mimic diet to clean the cells, adjust their weight, and maintain healthy level of metabolism. What I did agree with our uh, carnivore MD. Uh, was that, okay, so my ancestral mothers and fathers, the Brunhilde and Beowulf uh, of thousands of years ago. Uh, so during the summer, you know, Brunhilde was out there getting plants and we were having uh, a lot of uh, non-poisonous leaves uh, and some tubers and a lot of dirt and some small animals that she was catching in the nets. Beowulf was out there getting the bigger game and bringing that back. And then during the winter, I wasn't eating many plant materials and I was either not eating or I was eating uh, carnivore. So I was willing to admit that certainly uh, several months out of every year, I was either fasting or being a carnivore. And at least, you know, seven months to nine months out of the year, I was clearly an omnivore. That is what we have the most historical precedent with as, a, as uh, homo sapiens. Are, are being omnivores, just very occasionally carnivores, and uh, fairly occasionally uh, having to fast. Hey, let me, on that same subject, let, let me give you another question. Um, so my wife and I, you know, will eat, you know, our meal at dinner because that's, quite frankly, when we're both home. We both work. And, yeah, same here. And so what, what say you that really, if we were going to do this correctly, we should eat our meal at breakfast and then start our fast at that point? Well, um, again, let's sort of think about Beowulf and Brunhilde back there about 100,000 years ago. You know, uh, Beowulf was out there hunting, and so he's going to come back uh, in the afternoon with his uh, brothers uh, and cousins, etc. And they'll probably be showing up around one o'clock. Then I'm making, I'm cooking that stuff. So maybe at best I'm eating two or three o'clock. So I bet we have probably a longer history of the feast mid-afternoon. And that's when we ate. And we probably had one meal a day. I, I mean, the, the concept of three meals a day was a newly introduced uh, European dictum to separate themselves from the savages. And my guess is historically, we probably had one meal a day. When we were farmers, when we became farmers uh, 10,000 years ago, we might have had a meal before going out and doing the farm work. You've slaved all day in the fields, working your tail off. 
and you come back in and you uh, have another meal in the evening. So we might have had two meals a day. But when we were hunting and gathering, it was one meal. Okay. And it was probably uh, late afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon at the earliest. Yeah, as I tell my patients, we didn't crawl out of our cave and say, what's for breakfast? Yeah, we had to go catch it. Yeah, and breakfast means break fast, and that's yeah. when we found it. Uh, the other thing that interests me is, as you know, uh, our cortisol levels rise early in the morning, uh, around, starting around 4 o'clock in the morning, and that actually kicks up our blood sugar. And my argument to people saying breakfast is the most important meal of the day would be that we seemingly have an evolutionary fix for the fact that we weren't going to have food early in the day because cortisol you know, makes us insulin resistant and it kicks up our blood sugar and we're actually off and running. So I, all my diabetic patients, I actually say, haven't you noticed that your blood sugar goes up early in the morning? And they go, yeah. And I said, well, believe it or not, that's on purpose. And you were, yeah. you were designed for this. So the idea that we've got to get that meal in first thing that we wake up, just it doesn't make any physiologic sense. No, no, I don't, I don't think there's any need for that. All right. Um, so like I say, you, you change your ideas, bless your heart. <laughs> what have you learned about the microbiome that you didn't know five years ago? Um, that my colleagues are really getting excited about uh, our microbiome, that uh, they admit we don't really know what species we should have in our microbiome. Uh, even my microbiome scientist admits that he doesn't know what species are the right species to have, that probably it's what these species can do. Uh, and that, you know, microbes are, are gene swapping all of the time. Uh, and so even though we may have these probiotics because they're being cultured uh, in these big steel vats, they're gene swapping all the time, we don't know what processes that microbe can do. And it's the processes that I need, not the name of the species. Uh, so th the research that is really the, the most interesting is the research that looks at the metabolites, the metabolome. Um, and we've got that frozen. So, so, so we're going to be uh, analyzing that. Uh, Metabolon uh, looks at about 20,000 different compounds that are in your urine, your blood, your poop, uh, your spinal fluid, and sees how that changes. Uh, so it's going to. We're writing grants now, so hopefully there'll be a time when I'm going to be able to analyze the changes in our uh, blood, urine, and stool as people adopt the Walls diet or as they adopt any of the other diets that we study. I uh, and because you see. That is what I think the change in the diet that you advocate and that I advocate, that our, our gut then you know, digests that foods into smaller compounds that get into our bloodstream that help us run the chemistry of life. And it's, it's the microbiome making these metabolites that influence our health. So that's very exciting. I, I talk about that uh, in the book. We are writing grants. Hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, we will, you know, get funded, be able to analyze that stuff, uh, and so, you know, hopefully uh, in 2021 or 2022, I can begin to much more specifically address that. Fantastic. Uh, you're famous for advising people to eat nine cups of vegetables a day. Now, yeah, yeah. Now, most people equate because of dietary advice fruits and vegetables as equally healthy and because fruits taste good and vegetables yes. don't, they tend to head for the fruits. Uh, yeah. In your new book, you uh, aren't particularly wild about fruit. And as you know, I have told people to give fruit the boot. So what say you? So our fruit is very, very different. It's been uh, cultivated to have a lot more starch, uh, have a lot uh, higher fructose content. Uh, and so that's very different than the type of fruits that would have been uh, our ancestors would have consumed. Uh, for them, berries uh, would have been you know, like this huge treat, uh, a very seasonal treat. You could have that 
uh, and it uh, probably does not have nearly the amount of lectins because the f- plants want us to eat the fruit, so they aren't going to be as noxious towards it. True. The uh, fruits that we have cultivated and created, again, have so much more fructose, so many more carbs, uh, and, and frankly, so do a lot of the starchy vegetables. So what I've discovered in my clinics and our clinical trials is that people ramped up on the fruit and did not have near the amount of vegetables I wanted them to have. So I've, I've made it much more explicit that we're uh, dialing down uh, the fruit. And my preference is that what we're talking about uh, ideally are, are berries. I think berries are the most beneficial uh, of the fruit. Uh, it's so much more important to get the greens, to get the sulfur, and a small amount of fruit. If you have a belly that's bigger than your butt, then I'd rather you not have any fruit. And that's, that's most Americans, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that is most Americans. And unfortunately, most children now, too. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Make sure to check out the next one here.